Los Angeles, California, the 15th of January, 1947. Betty Bersinger hurried down Norton Avenue. The heels of her shoes clicked on the concrete sidewalk, seeming eerily loud, echoing in the quiet morning air. It was cold and dreary. A light fog hung across the street, causing the houses in the distance to melt away into grey obscurity. Betty could just make out a few young children up ahead, riding on bicycles, perhaps on their way to school. Apart from them, Norton Avenue seemed utterly deserted. Just Betty and her three-year-old daughter Anne, sitting contentedly in her stroller. The houses on Betty's right abruptly stopped, giving way to an open expanse of ragged wasteland. The war had brought development in the area to a grinding halt, and this barren stretch of earth always made Betty feel slightly uneasy. Rough grass and tangled weeds poked up through cracked concrete. The wheels of Anne's stroller crunched over shards of broken glass that gleamed dully in the flat morning light. Something up ahead caught Betty's eye. A pale shape, lying just off the sidewalk in a patch of dry grass. As she drew closer, Betty could see stiff limbs, a head, a vaguely human shape. A store mannequin, she thought, ghostly white plastic, lying in two separate pieces on the scrubby ground. It was an oddly unsettling sight. Who would leave such a disturbing object here by the side of the road to scare the children as they cycled past? Betty walked a little nearer. She could see a wild tangle of jet black hair, fingers, toes, gaping wounds in pale flesh. This was no mannequin. The Dahlia and the Doctor a bite-sized fright. This series contains disturbing content. Listener discretion is advised. Detective Lieutenant Jesse Haskins pulled his car over to the side of the road. He had to park some distance down Norton Avenue as the street was already rammed with police vehicles. Officers and other detectives hurried back and forth, establishing a cordon around the crime scene trying to keep back the reporters and curious bystanders that circled like vultures. Haskins flashed his badge at the nearest officers, and they parted to let him through. A sheet lay on the ground, long and white, though not long enough to completely cover the body that lay beneath it. Two pale feet stuck out at the bottom, surrounded by broken glass and discarded litter. Haskins sighed. Another day, another body. Violent crime was on the rise in L.A. in the wake of the war, but this was a nice family neighborhood, up and coming. This sort of thing wasn't supposed to happen here. He gestured to an officer, who knelt and gingerly peeled back the sheet. Haskins felt vomit rise in his throat, hot and sour. He took an involuntary step backwards, staring in horrified disbelief at the nightmare scene revealed before him. The naked body on the ground was that of a woman, short and slim, with thick dark hair and blue eyes. She was young, Haskins thought, possibly early twenties, but it was impossible to tell for certain now. Her face was hideously mutilated, covered in bruises and impact wounds. Her cheeks had been sliced open from the corners of her mouth to form a grotesque, red parody of a smile. Chunks of flesh were missing from her body, neatly sliced away with a sharp knife and practiced hand. Haskins reeled. He was no stranger to death. He had seen more than his fair share of corpses in the line of duty. This was something else. The girl had been neatly cut in two, sliced in half just above the waist. The separate parts of her body had been deliberately posed a foot apart from one another, with arms bent up over her head and legs spread wide. Covering his mouth with a handkerchief, Haskins reluctantly knelt for a closer look. 
Flies buzzed and hummed around the body, crawling in and out of gaping wounds and skittering across the girl's glassy, staring eyes. Haskins understood why the woman who had first reported the grisly discovery had initially thought the corpse was a store mannequin. The girl was shockingly pale, white, almost translucent. There was no blood at the crime scene. It had all been drained from the body elsewhere, leaving behind a ghostly, pallid husk. Haskins peered a little closer and saw with horror that the girl's intestines had been removed, neatly folded and placed beneath her buttocks. He sniffed. There was an odd smell lingering over the crime scene, something sharp and chemical that cut through the sickly tang of dead flesh. He sniffed again and felt his blood turn to ice. Gasoline. He was sure of it. The body had been scrubbed with gasoline to destroy fingerprints, physical evidence the killer may have left behind. Haskins knew all too well what that meant. This foul murder was not the work of some random maniac, a rage-fueled drifter who acted with no regard for the consequences. No, they were dealing with a professional, a cold, calculating monster with enough rational thought to cover his tracks once the killing fury had subsided. This probably was not the first time they had taken a human life, and it wouldn't be the last. Haskins looked down at the pallid, bisected corpse on the ground, feeling sick to his stomach. He squeezed his eyes tightly shut for a second, trying to compose himself. He hoped the poor girl had been dead long before the horrific mutilations had taken place. The alternative didn't bear thinking about. Haskins got to his feet. With slightly trembling fingers, he lit a cigarette, took a deep, steadying drag and gazed out across the barren expanse of the vacant lots. What a terrible, soulless place for the body of a young woman, someone's daughter, to be dumped in so callously. Haskins gestured to the officer to cover the body once more. He let out a shaking breath as the sheet was lowered, knowing that the sight of that terrible, mutilated face, the dead eyes and butchered, milk-white torso had been forever seared into his memory. He could feel the threat of tears prickling at his eyes, so he turned and stomped off towards his car. He had a job to do, a killer to catch. The mystery of the Black Dahlia had just begun. Elizabeth Short was born in Boston, Massachusetts on the 29th of July, 1924. Her father faked his own death and abandoned the family when Elizabeth was only six years old. Twelve years later, she relocated to California to live with her estranged father, after he had sent the family an apologetic letter revealing that he was, in fact, still alive. Unsurprisingly, the reunion was not a happy one, and Short soon found herself bouncing between temporary homes in California, Florida, and Massachusetts. In July 1946, aged just 22, she found herself in Los Angeles, working part-time as a waitress and renting a small room just off Hollywood Boulevard. Six months later, she was dead, discovered on a patch of wasteland in two bloodless pieces, bearing marks of torture and mutilation that would turn even the strongest of stomachs. The grisly and graphic nature of her death sparked a nationwide media frenzy. The crime was initially dubbed the werewolf murder, due to the sheer brutality inflicted on the poor girl's body. However, this was quickly swept aside when rumors started to swirl about Elizabeth Short's penchant for dressing only in black clothes and wearing flowers in her long, dark hair. The press began calling her by the nickname that would immortalize the case in a web of film noir intrigue and mystery, the Black Dahlia. This case has become so steeped in legend that it is difficult to separate fact from fiction. While the police scrambled to hunt down the killer, the press had a field day, peddling lies, speculations, half-truths and rumors, each more salacious and sensational than the next. 
they indulged in some truly appalling victim-blaming, labelling Elizabeth Short as a man-hungry delinquent, an aspiring Hollywood starlet with dark and mysterious beauty, obsessed with sheer blouses and tight skirts. She was a sex worker, a prostitute, a call girl, a home wrecker, and a tease. No doubt she had driven whichever man had slain her to madness with her flirtatious ways. Honesty and integrity were tossed aside in the pursuit of the most gripping, scandalous headlines. Perhaps most sickening of all, once Elizabeth had been identified from her fingerprints, one reporter tracked down her mother, Phoebe Short, in Massachusetts. He called Phoebe, claiming that her daughter had won a beauty contest, and he was writing an article about her. Would she tell him everything she could about Elizabeth's life, her lovers and ambitions? He did not reveal that Elizabeth was dead until the interview was over. The paper even offered to fly Phoebe down to L.A. to assist in the police investigation, but upon her arrival they confined her to a hotel room to pump her for gossip and information and to protect their exclusive scoop. The Los Angeles Police Department did not approve of the media's underhanded tactics and sensationalized reporting of the Black Dahlia case. However, the press investigation was turning up some useful leads, so law enforcement reluctantly allowed them to continue. They had a murder to solve, after all. Intense fear of a second brutal slaying was beginning to swirl around the City of Angels. Their task was not an easy one. They had little to go on. Short's body had been meticulously washed, removing any physical clues the police might have used to narrow down a suspect. Tracking her movements in the last few days of her life also proved to be incredibly difficult. The last confirmed sighting of the Black Dahlia before her death had been on the 9th of January, where a doorman at the Biltmore Hotel claimed to have seen her using a payphone in the lobby. Several unconfirmed sightings placed her at various other establishments across the city that evening, including the infamous Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. The Cecil already had a somewhat seedy reputation and was a hotspot for suicides. It was here that 21-year-old student Elisa Lamb would die under mysterious circumstances 66 years later, her decomposing body discovered floating in a rooftop water tank. We covered this chilling case in an earlier episode of Bite-Sized Frights, the mysterious death of Elisa Lamb. If you have not listened to this episode yet, we recommend that you do so. It is a creepy and disturbing story to say the least, and remains unexplained to this day. Wherever the Black Dahlia had been on the night of the 9th of January, it wasn't until six days later that her mutilated remains were found on Norton Avenue. The police were desperate to fill in the so-called missing week. The coroner had concluded that Short had only been dead for around ten hours before her body was discovered. So where had she been for those six days prior, and with whom? How long had she been with her killer before she died? Time was of the essence, this dangerous, psychopathic butcher, now nicknamed the Werewolf, would no doubt strike again if he was not brought to justice soon. Luckily, the police were not short of suspects. First, there was Robert Red Manley, a married man whom Elizabeth Short had been dating. He was the last person to have seen Short alive. He claimed he had dropped her off at the Biltmore Hotel on the 9th of January after the pair had taken a brief trip to San Diego and that he hadn't seen her since. Manley had a history of mental illness. He had been discharged from the army following a series of nervous breakdowns and had undergone some questionable treatment in psychiatric facilities to remove the voices in his head. On the 24th of January 1947, the Los Angeles Examiner received a mysterious package, sent to them by someone claiming to be the killer. The package had been wiped down with gasoline and contained personal items belonging to the Black Dahlia, including her birth certificate along with an address book with the name Mark Hansen embossed on the cover. 
Hansen was a wealthy nightclub owner whose girlfriend Anne had lived with Elizabeth Short in a small apartment near Hollywood Boulevard. He identified the address book as his own and claimed he had given it to Short as a gift. He immediately became a prime suspect after his girlfriend claimed the Black Dahlia had repeatedly rejected Hansen's sexual advances, which could possibly have driven him into a murderous rage. As time went by, the police received numerous other packages and letters, mostly made from words cut and pasted from magazines and newspapers. Many of the messages appeared to be from the same mysterious person, some claiming the killer would hand himself in soon, others that he would surrender if promised a lenient sentence. Some of the messages were far more sinister, stating that, I've had my fun, the Dahlia killing was justified. The police even found an apparent suicide note in a pile of men's clothes discarded at the edge of the ocean near Venice Beach. It read, To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but they have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that, or this. Sorry, Mary. The identity of whoever left this note was never discovered. While it may seem like an intriguing clue, it is worth noting that over the years, more than 500 different people have confessed to slaying the Black Dahlia. Many of them were not even born at the time her life was so tragically taken away. Though the injuries inflicted on Elizabeth Short, both before and after her death, were horrific in the extreme, it was clearly not the work of some brutish axe murderer. Parts of her flesh had been neatly sliced away, and she had been cut in two with almost surgical precision, using a technique pioneered in the 1930s called a hemicorporectomy. The police began to narrow in on suspects with medical or surgical training, such as doctors, morticians, and army medics. Patrick S. O'Reilly was a medical doctor who had met the Black Dahlia through his friend, Mark Hansen. He made his way onto the list of prime suspects due to his surgical knowledge and the fact that he had a violent criminal past. He had been convicted of assault after taking his secretary to a motel room and savagely beating her, almost to death, in an act of sadistic, sexual frustration. Furthermore, O'Reilly's right pectoral muscle had been surgically removed earlier in his life, the same muscle had been neatly sliced away from the body of the Black Dahlia. An odd coincidence, indeed. The list of suspects grew ever longer, ranging from jilted lovers to a mysterious female surgeon, rumored to have been in an amorous relationship with the Black Dahlia. The police even investigated a few high-profile celebrities suspected of being the werewolf killer, including folk singer Woody Guthrie, legendary filmmaker Orson Welles, and infamous mobster Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. Then the attention of law enforcement fell on Dr. George Hill Hodel. He had been recently accused of molesting his 14-year-old daughter Tamar, along with performing an illegal backstreet abortion after she became pregnant with his child. The police also suspected he had murdered his secretary, Ruth Spaulding, after he discovered that she was about to report his numerous medical malpractices and scams. Hodel had been present when the secretary had died from an accidental overdose, and had apparently burnt many of her papers and files before alerting the police. He was a suspect in another grisly case, the Green Twig murder, where a young woman named Louise Springer had been strangled to death in her car, sparking a massive manhunt. As suspicions mounted, undercover officers followed Hodel's every movement, and covert listening devices were concealed in his house. On the 18th of February 1950, one of the microphones picked up a disturbing conversation, in which Hodel was recorded saying, Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary anymore because she's dead. They thought there was something fishy. Anyway, 
Now they may have figured it out. Killed her. Maybe I did kill my secretary. It seems that many of the high-ranking officers attached to the Black Dahlia case were convinced of Dr. Hodel's guilt, certain that he was the werewolf. But they never had enough hard evidence to convict him. Hodel left the USA in the early 1950s and relocated to the Philippines, where his story took another mysterious, gruesome turn. On the 28th of May, 1967, the body of beauty store owner Lucila Lalu was found in a park in the Filipino capital of Manila. She had been sliced in half at the waist and drained of blood, just like Elizabeth Short. Reports from the time indicate that two other women had been murdered and found in a similar, mutilated state, bisected and dumped in the wasteland around Manila only a couple of years earlier. The police interrogated several suspects and even gained a questionable confession, but ultimately could not link anybody satisfactorily to the grisly crime, which became known as the Jigsaw Murder. The similarities between the brutal killings of Elizabeth Short and Lucila Lalu are undeniable. This unique method of murder and mutilation can be seen almost as a killer's calling card, his signature. Dr. George Hodel was living in Manila at the time Lucila Lalu was slain. This has led many people, including Hodel's own family, to believe that he was responsible for both murders, and possibly dozens more throughout the USA and abroad. Hodel died in 1999, aged 91. No charges were ever formally leveled against him. Since his death, his son, Steve Hodel, who is an LAPD homicide detective, has written numerous books and articles linking his father to a bloody wealth of vicious killings. These include the infamous Zodiac murders of the 1960s and the Chicago Lipstick murders, in which a six-year-old girl was sliced in half at the waist before being dismembered and tossed into a sewer. No one has ever been convicted for the horrific murder of Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia. The terrible crime remains unsolved more than 70 years on, but the case refuses to die. The gruesome mystery has captivated the minds of law enforcement officers and armchair detectives for generations. The Black Dahlia lives on in their inquisitive souls. What do you think? Was Elizabeth Short murdered by a man she had driven to madness? A crime of passion fueled by her dark beauty and flirtatious ways? Or was she the victim of a soulless maniac? A serial killer whose lust for blood and mutilation knew no bounds? The jilted lover, the butcher surgeon, or the doctor of death? It seems we will never know for certain. We would love to hear your own thoughts and ideas about this murderous mystery. If you have enjoyed this episode, please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Pixel Elixir and subscribe at bitesizedfrights.com so that you never miss any of our terrifying tales. This has been a Pixel Elixir production narrated by Chris K. Thank you for listening. Until the next bite, my friends.